to our worship service today. If you do need to look at any of the directions, they are printed on page 5 of the things that will be following continuing the same practice. Also today we'll be celebrating communion and uh, if you look on either side uh, of the worship space today, you'll see the little individual communion cups. Actually in these cups there is uh, on one side a small little uh, chip of bread or a wafer and on the other side is the communion wine, and I'll be giving some instructions later as to how to uh, access this uh, when we get to that part of the service, but the ushers will be coming around, the ushers are also eager to help anyone who has any questions about them, um, that's how we'll be taking communion uh, during our worship service today. We'll be following again the printed sheets that are on, your, uh, on the chairs, so please uh, take those and then please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. First scripture reading today from Romans chapter 4. In this section, we see how Abraham becomes a father. He trusts God's promise, even though there's no earthly way this can work, and God credits to him as righteousness. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. 
And this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. As we celebrate Father's Day today and we also think about the blessings of our Heavenly Father, we'll consider our first hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father. Thank you. 
was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Continue now and we'll listen to our next hymn. Now let us all in hymns of praise. Savior, Jesus Christ. This evening we'll consider a portion of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. I'll read verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, fathers face challenges. I read a number of articles this past week, one that was pretty interesting because it was stated in the father's own words. They said the things they felt that were difficulties for them. And perhaps not surprisingly, a, a couple of things that were on the top of the list. 
We're, number one, trying to find this work and family balance. Fathers today are saying that they feel a time crunch. And they don't feel like they can adequately handle their responsibilities at work and their responsibilities at home. A second category was communication. That fathers want to be connected to their uh, spouses, to their children, but they often feel like they don't know what to say. They don't know what to say to their little children. They don't know what to say to their teenagers. But who knows what to say to teenagers, right? But one of the things the article did not pick up on, because it often talked about you know, fathers acknowledging their shortcomings, was what happens when it's the other way around? What happens when the fathers are the ones who are hurt? Or the fathers are the ones who are offended by someone in the family? Then how do the fathers handle that situation? Well, that's what we'll consider this morning. Because sometimes there are times when fathers get hurt too. Uh, there's this story of a father, and he understood he was always busy at work, and he didn't always know how to talk with his children. But one thing he realized is his, his little son, he loved to get a piggyback ride. And so every night the father would come home, the son would come running up to him, he'd pick his son up, take him up here, you know, put him up here, you know, give him one of these little rides on his shoulders. And then one night while he's doing that, he's holding on to his son, all of a sudden he just feels this really sharp pain in his head. And... Uh, goes away and then it comes back and then it comes back a third time and finally he takes his son off and he puts him back down again on the ground on the floor and he says he says did you pull my hair and the little guy goes yeah <laughs> he says did you bite my hair <laughs> and he says yeah <laughs> says, you can't do that he said, but Daddy, I was just trying to get my bubble gum back. <laughs> How do you love your children through their mistakes? How do you become a forgiving father? This morning we'll consider that as we look at these words from Luke chapter 15. Today's lesson comes from the section that we often refer to as the parable of the prodigal son. Perhaps you remember Jesus' words in this section. Remember what happens? It talks about the interaction between the father and his son. The son comes up to the father and he asks him for his share of the estate, a rather unusual request to ask for your inheritance while your father was still alive. But the father complies, he gathers up his wealth, and he gives it to his son. His son, then it says, gathers up all of his belongings and heads off. And then the Jesus parable says that this young son squanders the money in wild living. And if you listen later to the brother's commentary on it, it suggests he even squandered it in immoral living. Stop and think about that. How would you feel as a father to have that request, first of all, in so many words saying like, you know, I don't care about you, all I want is my money, than to have someone go out and waste that wealth to reject the Father's teaching, to reject the Father. How would you respond to something like that? <coughs> no, parenting is such an amazing journey, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A little child is born and parents do absolutely everything for the child. You, you hold the child, you feed the child, you clothe them, you put them to bed, you wake them up. Sometimes they wake you up. <laughs> Parents
parents make every decision for the child at first. But then through the course of, say, around 20 years, all of that changes, doesn't it? Now the child's doing all those things for himself or for herself. And someday they're out on their own. And then what happens as a parent? You're waiting and wondering, how are they going to turn out? How are they going to act? Are they still going to respect me? Are they still going to love me and care about me as I grow older? An amazing journey of parenting. And how do you handle situations then when children make mistakes or do things you don't approve of? Like this father in the story here that Jesus tells. How do you handle that? Well, Jesus tells us how this father handled it. It says here that this son went off and he squandered his father's money and then he hit bottom. And then at one point he decided, I need to get back home. And so he packed up his things again, a lot fewer things than he had when he left. And he comes back home. And it says then, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, kissed him. The picture there of a father who was already looking and waiting for his son to return. And then when he returns, he runs to him and meets with him and welcomes him. His son said, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And his father is just... His heart is overflowing with forgiveness and love. He's so glad to have his son back. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? To have a heart full of that much love. We, we listen to that story as fathers. We listen to that story. And we say to ourselves, I want my children to know that even if they make a mistake, they can come back. That's the kind of father I want to be. <coughs> and children hear that story and they say, that's the kind of father I want my father to be, too. But you read this and you realize it's a parable. There aren't fathers like that. Are there? I mean, if a, if a child comes back, isn't there at least from the father a sarcastic remark or an I told you so? I mean, is there a father whose heart is that full of love and forgiveness that he just accepts his child back unconditionally? That doesn't really exist in real life, does it? And of course, that's Jesus' point. Because he's saying, that is your Father. That's your Heavenly Father. That's what God is like. When you read through this section in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables, one after the next, all describing the heart of the Father, how eager the Father is to have His children back, how forgiving He is, how loving He is. And that's what Jesus is saying to the people of the day. He's saying to them, you've been wasting your time. You've been wasting your blessings from your father. You've rejected your father's teaching. You've rejected your father. But he still loves you. Jesus was trying to instill in the hearts of his listeners that type of loving heart for people. People that would be eager to forgive. How do we do that in our families? Through the 
course of human relationships, there's always wrongs that are done. There's always words that are spoken or there's things that aren't spoken, things that are done or that are left undone that hurt. It's easier just to build up anger and resentment. How do you become that kind of forgiving person? That kind of forgiving father? You know, one thing I, I noticed when I read through those articles is that there's a lot of a lot of men that understand their shortcomings and they're not afraid to say it. They know. But what do Christians do when we understand our mistakes and our sins? Do we just feel guilty about them? Do we just become frustrated or angry that we're not the kind of person that we really want to be? That's not what Christians do. Christians, by the very name itself, turn to Christ. Christians look to Christ. They look to the cross. They recognize what Jesus did. They understand that they're Forgiven. The, the only way to become a forgiving person, to become a forgiving father, is to know that you're a forgiven father first. A forgiven father becomes a forgiving father. A father who understands that he has a father who loves him and who cares about him. You know, we ask our fathers to do a lot, don't we? We ask them to provide and protect, to teach and discipline, to hold and love, to encourage and challenge, to be an example, a role model in a world crying out for good role models, right? And one place children look is to their fathers. And so that's where fathers need to look, too to their fathers, to their heavenly father, that is, who provides and protects, who teaches and disciplines, who holds them and loves them, who encourages and challenges, who serves as an example for them. So fathers go to their father for forgiveness, strength, for love, that's where we go. That's where all God's people go. So here's the question. Can you love your children through a mistake? Can you love them through a rebellious period in life? Can you be strong when they are weak? Can you be there when they are absent? Can you continue to show love and caring and compassion to them even when they struggle? And the only way that we can even get close to doing that, fathers, to be a forgiving father, is to remember that you're a forgiven father. And that you have a father who does those things for you. So let us run today to our father for his strength. close with this today. I watched this little video. A father was telling his story. His son turned 19. One day uh, his wife goes in to the son's room, finds a note on the bed, reads the note. Son says that he feels like he's not living up to his parents' expectations and he's leaving. He's gone 
have no idea where he's, where he's going. Parents call the girlfriend. Girlfriend doesn't even know that this young man has left. Says something about Akron, Ohio. They live in Michigan. Father grabs his keys, grabs his wife, they hop into the truck, drive four hours to Akron, Michigan, they get there. You know, what do they find except the city? Go to a little restaurant, find a police officer. The father is pouring out his heart about this story. Person from another booth comes over, hears the story, says, can I come and pray for you? Man isn't even a Christian, but he says, sure, you can pray. They leave Ohio. Somebody does some research to find out the son actually took a bus all the way to Atlanta. Father grabs his keys, drives down, picks up a buddy of his, drives all the way down to Atlanta. They get down to Atlanta. What do they find? It's just the city of Atlanta. Put up a bunch of flyers, looking all around, can't find him anywhere. Father says later on, the hardest decision I ever made was to leave, drive back home. He gets back home, still doesn't know what to do. Very much troubled. Actually calls a church down in Atlanta. Says the person on the phone is so kind and caring. Hangs up the phone and says a prayer to God. Says if you just bring my son back, he said, I, I will follow you. Says that prayer. Minutes later, his son walks in the door. The father is so thankful. He and his wife, for the first time, go to church the next Sunday. The article ends with this. The father says, I didn't realize that while I was searching for my son, that God was searching for me. It's amazing, isn't it? The things that God accomplishes in us and through us and even in our families. That this forgiven father could now be a forgiving father. May the knowledge on this Father's Day that we have a God in heaven who knows and loves us, who guides and directs us, who cares about us, who's there for us even when we're absent, who loves us even when we're not, who forgives us even when we're rebellious, that we have a forgiving Father. May that lead us to also show that kind of forgiveness to one another. A forgiven father is a forgiving father. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Dear Lord, Today we pray for our fathers. We thank you for all fathers that seek to serve their families, to provide for their needs, to help their children grow and learn, to love their wives, those who are protectors for their teaching and discipline, for their holding and loving, for times enjoyed together. We know that our fathers are not perfect, but help us also communicate and show love for them. Let us honor and respect the institution of fatherhood that you have established and help fathers to be men worthy of respect. Help them to be driven by integrity and love. Strengthen them so that they may demonstrate forgiveness and be earthly examples of your love. We ask this in our Savior's name. We also pray today for the family of Jean Brostrom, whose brother-in-law, Vernon England, passed away last week. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of life that you granted Vernon, especially for the gift of faith given to him in your son. Now strengthen and comfort his family, that they may remember your promise that you are the resurrection and the life, and that you are a father 
filled with love and compassion. We bring all these prayers in our Savior's name, who has also taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now we'll just take a moment to explain the communion practice for this morning, since this will be the first time that we'll be uh, having communion for quite some time as a congregation. Mm -hmm. On the tables, there are uh, a number of these individual cups. On one side is the wine, and on the other side is the bread. And so in a few moments, what will happen is the ushers will come by, and they will dismiss you. Uh, folks on this side can go to those tables, and individuals on this side can go to those tables. You can just pick one of these up and then return to your seat. And while you're seated, you can turn it so that the, the bread is on the top, and then you can pull this off. It comes off relatively easily. There's a little tap that's taking it off. It's, a, it's not exactly a wafer. It's more of a little chip of bread, but you can take that off and then just wait at that point. After everyone has then received uh, the bread and wine, then I'll speak the words of uh, institution, and I'll say, take and eat, take and drink. And then if you do that, then you flip it upside down, pull this off. You don't have to pull, you don't have to pull it all the way off and actually just leave it on. It'll just stay on like this. And then you can take the, uh, drink the wine. And then if you can just hold that, and at the end of the service, the ushers will have some baskets that are available throughout the space here. We can just discard them then. So that's the practice that will follow today. If anyone is having difficulty for whatever reason um, with removing these, the ushers are going to be coming around. They'll be glad they have gloves on things. They'll be glad to be able to help you with that. So if you feel like you can't get it off, can't get it off safely, not a problem. The ushers will come, come by uh, your seats right before we do take the Lord's Supper. So I'll continue now with the words of the institution, then we'll give a moment for preparation to give you an opportunity just for silent prayer to prepare yourself to receive this, this great forgiveness that we have in this forgiving God, to know that Jesus is our Savior and that we can walk out of here today as his forgiven people, empowered to live for him. And then after that, we'll invite you to come forward to receive, uh, to take one of those and receive the Lord's Supper. So, our Lord Jesus Christ, when the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now we'll pause for preparation for Holy Communion. You know, I invite you to come forward and reset at the usher's direction and again to take one of those little individual cups and then return to your seat.
upside down so that the bread is at the top. Pull that tab off. And the ushers will walk around for anyone setting. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior shed for you on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. May this strengthen and uphold you the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close with the final verse tonight. Father, God in grace.
Also, our work day is coming up this Saturday now. Some work has already been done. If you drive past the teachers, you'll notice a new front door is already on there. So some projects have already been started. But if you're able to help uh, with some of this on Saturday, we're starting at 7 a.m. Saturday morning. Uh, please join us. Lots and lots of projects to do. So if you can help with that, I'd uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, we'll be working on the newsletter for next month. So continue to stay close to that. We've been looking this week. Uh, um, governor came out with some guidance with respect to schools, saying essentially that they're going to be making a decision about schools uh, towards the end of July. So we're kind of waiting. He's they've been talking about uh, preparing for three possible eventualities. One would be that school starts kind of as normal. Number two, that there's a hybrid plan. And number three, that distance learning continues. So we're just waiting. I'm sure others are as well for more information. So. That information will be coming out when we know it as well. Uh, may the Lord continue to bless your day, remembering that you have a forgiving Father, and may each of us also be forgiving people, showing his love to the world. May the Lord bless your day.